As humans, we often fall into the trap of thinking uh, that any person or situation or event is really made up of just one thing, right? That there's only one thing involved. Or uh, we may broaden that and fall into the trap of the fallacy of either or, right? That it's either got to be this or that, that there's no way it could be both. And, and it's always got to be, you know, either one thing or these two things. But the truth is human nature and human relationships are much more complex than that. We are, we are all connected to one another and everything that one person does will impact and influence those around them and those in their sphere of influence. And the same thing is true of, of our relationship with technology and the way that we use technology in our lives. We impact it. It obviously impacts us and, and drives us. So uh, bring all this up because um, this is really the premise of a, uh, an important communication theory and, and philosophy known as media ecology, media ecology. And uh, so that's what we're going to take a look at in this video is the uh, you know, definition of media ecology. What is it? Why is it important? How does it impact our lives? And why is understanding it um, valuable to us as communicators in the modern age? So media ecology really starts way back with a guy named Marshall McLuhan who developed this, he's a communication theorist, developed this idea called technological determinism. Marshall McLuhan uh, in the, in the mid 20th century came up with this idea of technological determinism. And his, his, uh, his uh, idea said that a society's technology determines its cultural values, its social structure, and its history. In other words, um, that social progress in a society is driven by technological innovation, that it's that intertwined, right? That the, the type and, and, pro and speed with which technology develops will impact um, the development of that society and the way that people interact with one another in general. Right? He said, oh, we need to examine the effect of technology on the nature of human relationships. So what's the, uh, what's the connection between the development of this technology over, over history and in, and in our current times with the way that we relate to one another as humans, the way that we interact, the way that we communicate and the way that we uh, essentially deal with one another on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, in technological determinism, there are a couple different uh, ages, you know, periods that McLuhan identified. The first is what we call the tribal age. So we're thinking back to the earliest civilizations, right? This is before the written word even existed. And uh, McLuhan said, well, in, a, in the tribal age, you were so dependent on those around you, your tribe in this limited geographic area where the people who spoke the same language as you had the same values as you, um, you know, and, and were responsible for your safety and that they recognized that the safety and, and, uh, ability to thrive for everyone in that tribe depended on all the others, right? So to get along uh, was, was paramount to be able to get along with your neighbors and to, to provide for everybody and, and look out for everybody. Also that language was all, all entirely verbal. Right. It was entirely um, spoken. We didn't have the written word at that time. So if you ventured too far away from your tribe, you were going to be totally disconnected from your history and from, you know, present events and things, because you were going to be in an area where you didn't speak the language. You had no connection, no way of of really accurately transmitting um, messages across you know, extensive um, um, uh, distances. So um, the tribal age, everything was really centered around that tribe and it had a huge impact on culture and certainly had a huge impact on communication because everything was part of the spoken word then, right? But eventually, with, you know, the need to send messages across greater distances and things led us into what is called the literacy age, what McLuhan called the literacy age, where you had the first development of the um, written word, so to speak, or written, you know, even symbols that represented these ideas. And so you could carve them in. And, and if two people have the same understanding of what that symbol meant, then you could communicate that then across great distances. And so that allowed people to branch out a little bit and to, to get away from their tribe, so to speak, a little bit, you could still be connected to your tribe and still receive the news of your tribe. It also allowed people to, to pass history down in a more permanent way and more cohesive way um, than just the spoken word. I mean, if you've ever played a game of telephone, you know how quickly when it's just spoken, how that can break down very quickly, right? So the literacy age ushered that in. And also really started to divide um, people in terms of culture in a sense that, for example, if you take the Bible, only only the richest people and only the um, uh, those who are rich and those who were really educated in religion, so priests and, and things, were able to read. Reading was not something that most people could do. It was a very limited amount of people that could do that, that were literate. So during the literacy age, 
those people really were in a sense of uh, were in a place of power because they could read. Um, first of all, it takes forever to write a Bible. If you can imagine how long a Bible is, that had to be handwritten. Right? So everyone had to be handwritten. It became such a valuable property, um, not only because there weren't very many of them, but because then you could learn to read. It's hard to learn to read if you don't have anything to read, right? So during the literacy age, you had these people that were able to kind of branch out and get away. And we had this transmission of history in a different way, and, and but but still very limited in that sense, right? There weren't that many people who could read and write, and so I'm um, somewhat limited. Now, uh, one of the, the biggest changes in human history came about in what McLuhan called the print age because we had the invention of the printing press that you see here, right? The printing press, Gutenberg's printing press was invented allowed for the mass production of books and publications and newspapers and things. And so because those materials were available, more people learned how to read. More people had access to those materials. More people were able to learn how to read. More people were uh, able to um, you know, discover things on their own, find out information on their own, and not just depend on the information that, that someone else shared with them and the accuracy of that information. They could actually go to a book or find it themselves or, or, you know, discover these ideas on their own. So it really opened up a world of possibility for people. And not in the least of which is that you could be separated from your clan, so to speak, from your tribe from a great distance and still have a permanent record of what happened there in history and still be able to connect with them could, because then you, they could write and you could read probably by then. So it allowed people to kind of spread out even more and venture out on their own. Right. So you start to see the, the, the real exploration, for example, in the United States, this was, this, you know, at the time in the United States, when we, we saw pioneers could, because they could be independent, they could go out on their own. Another example of, of a massive transition that happened as a result of the print age is the uh, Protestant revolution. When Lu Martin Luther um, nailed those, those items to the, the wall of the church, right? And uh, his list of, of, of complaints or demands or issues, whatever you want to call them. And, uh, and that happened as a result of people being able to read. They no longer were reliant on the, the priests to pass along information to them about their religion, about their faith, about, you know, before this time, nobody could read, you know, they couldn't read. So all they had was the word of the priests and they, they you know, whatever they shared with them. But now they could do it on their own. They weren't quite as dependent. And that led to a real um, uh, initially, you know, very uh, um, a time of innovation of thought, I guess, in individuals who decided that that maybe they didn't agree with everything the church was telling them and they wanted to take their own their faith into their own hands. And, and so you start to see this individualization of faith as well. So as a result of the printing press, again, more people could read, more people could write, more people had access to things like the Bible because they could be mass printed then. And you weren't just dependent on somebody sitting in a dark room for ages writing one out. So anyway, the print age really ushers in this ability to uh, to be physically separate from your, your tribe or, or your, you know, the place where you would call home, but still be connected, still have access to knowledge. And you see this tremendous expansion of knowledge during this time because again people could read and take in information on their own so you know the print age is really significant in the development of human history again affected by technology though you have the invention of this one piece of technology that really entirely changes the world um, and so again that that relationship between the development of technology and the way a society develops okay then we move into the electronic age you know we fast forward a couple hundred years we have the the you know you could include telegram and things like that in here, but the, the major focus is traditionally on radio and television as the electronic age. Um, so then you have even more of, of, of the ability to isolate, right? Now we can get the news, we can get entertainment and things through these electronic means. We don't ever have to see anybody to, to do that, right? We can just get it in our home. So we can still be somewhat connected to a society and yet be completely isolated in that sense. So again, technology uh, influencing the way that we interact with one another and the amount with, of, of time that we spend with one another and the way information is shared and the, you know, the gatekeeping function and all these things that are wrapped up in the electronic age, uh, advancing that uh, to now, this is where McLuhan would have stopped. I mean, and because this is, you know, what he saw during his lifetime, but, but since then we've added sort of a new media age and I've got an asterisk next to it, as you can see, because this isn't one of McLuhan's original, but it's a natural extension of what he was talking about. This new media age with computers and cell phones and, and the technology that we have in that regard with social media and different things. 
really has advanced even beyond, you know, the, the because now you have user created content significantly on um, uh, social media and on just you know, new media devices. So you have you're not real as reliant on the gatekeepers or the traditional gatekeepers of the news networks and things. You also have this expansion of things like streaming, where you're seeing so much more content available from so many more areas. Uh, to say nothing of the the advancement in things like texting, and uh, and just using messaging via social media, which again allows us to feel like we're having a coming together, like the world is shrinking because of this, and and it is in some ways, and in other ways it's creating even more isolation, right? Think about during the recent pandemic, many people were, were ordering groceries. I mean, never leaving the house. We were able to get our groceries without leaving and interacting with people. Really, we were able to, to, to get, um, you know, anything that we needed by just you know, ordering through Amazon or Walmart or whatever. And so it allows us to, to sort of feel like we're connected to other people by seeing what they had for breakfast and seeing all these things about them. But in truth, there's in a lot of ways, it's become even more isolating right so if we look at this a little bit differently just a, just a slightly different image we can see you know the tribal age again as a society we were really close together because the technology didn't exist to allow us to really move out very far from that but then as technology has advanced and we've innovated and grown technology it allows us to you know be more and more uh, away from the tribe it still feel connected and still be connected in some ways uh, and yet, it, look at the difference it's had on our interpersonal skills, for example, and uh, and the way that we connect with one another, the way, the way that we talk to one another, and all those types of things. So, anyway, really interesting, fascinating in my in my mind, one of my favorite uh, um, theories of communication, technological determinism. Another uh, idea that that McLuhan um, heralded a lot was was or uh, talked about a lot was this idea that the medium is the message. And so you can see here what he said about it. The medium is the message. This is merely to say that the personal and social consequences of any medium, that is, of any extension of ourselves, result from the new scale that is introduced into our affairs by each extension of ourselves or by any new technology. So he would say that, the, first of all, the medium is the message in, indicating that um, that. Um, that there are, there, are, there are consequences, there are both good and bad consequences that happen when we introduce a, a new technology, right? Um, there's also something to be said for um, the, the idea that the medium is the message in the sense that, um, that, uh, uh, that the way we choose to communicate is, is significant, right? It says something about that communication. Um, if you are going to ask someone out or break up with them. You know, is there a more appropriate way to do that than some others? You know, some people would say, well, yeah. Uh, and you know, people of my generation and above would say, well, you, you don't do that via text or maybe not even the, via the phone. You do that in person, face to face, right? But newer gener younger generations would say, well, texting is, is a very normal way to communicate. So why wouldn't you do that via text? But my generation would say, well, that sends a very specific impersonal message. When you text someone something personal like that, it's a very impersonal way to communicate. It indicates a lack of respect or, or um, uh, caring for that person. Uh, but, you know, again, generationally, that's different. But but uh, but there's a difference in the way that we communicate and how we choose to communicate. So the channel, he, he's saying, is significant. The channel that we choose to communicate says something about how we feel about that message, how we feel about that person. Right? And then uh, so all of that has consequences, the development of this technology in our in our society and the way that we relate to one another. Okay, so Marshall McLuhan really um, uh, was the, the kind of the godfather of this whole discussion. But uh, in some ways, techno technological determinism, as much as I love it, is, is somewhat limiting and doesn't necessarily bring the entire process into focus. Um, there's a, another gentleman named Neil Postman who, who came up with this uh, you know, kind of advancement in this way of thinking called media ecology which is what we're really going to focus on then. And it's developed out of this idea of technological determinism. But, but Postman said that, uh, that media ecology really is a, is, is a holistic systems-based examination of symbiotic relationship between humans, technology, and the environment. The environment meaning the context, the, the culture in which we live, and all of those um, factors, right? So he said it's not just, you know, one thing and then the other and, and one you know, back and forth. He said it's really this connection that all of it is connection. It's that, you know, traditional, you throw a stone in a calm pond and watch the ripples come out. 
that everything within this is connected to something else and everything affects everything else. And you throw it all in a blender and, and see what happens. So his goal is to increase awareness of the mutual effects, the effects that technology have on humans and, and back and, and vice versa, the impact that humans have on technology then, right? His, his, his idea is that this is a dynamic process rather than technology is the single driving force. So in technological determinism, it's technology pushing all this and really, really um, driving all of this and humans just kind of following along. But Postman said, no, this is really more of a, it's a connection. It's a back and forth. It's, it's sort of like we think about in Africa with the, the ecosystem there, right? Um, that the, the way that all of these things connect with one another, if you, if you take away the water, the water dries up, that affects the animals that live there, right? And the crops that grow and things, which of course affects the humans that are around there as well. It affects the land and those things move and, and then the, the ecology changes, right? But all of this is symbiotic. And Postman said the, 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 that our relationship with technology and the way it impacts us is much the same. Right? So if we think back to technological determinism again, we know that they uh, have this idea of this continual cycle. Technology evolves and humans adapt. Technology evolves and humans adapt. Repeat, right? It just goes all the way through those different types of things. But uh, but Postman said the the media ecology cycle is somewhat different, right? You have this, uh, you know, in terms of human interaction, we have this uh, these new tools that are developed, right? new technologies that come about, and new ways to communicate, and you have then the adoption or or not of these technologies. So some some technologies are adopted and some go by the wayside. You know, for example, I'm old enough to remember when MySpace was a thing. Right. And uh, if you're not, then you can look it up. But MySpace sort of was a predecessor to Facebook, but Facebook became much more um, used because it was more dynamic. And for a variety of reasons, a MySpace is no longer a thing. It's kind of a joke. It's kind of a trivia uh, answer to a trivia question. Right. So some of these technologies are adopted, but not all of them. Some of them go by the wayside. So when we choose to adopt a new technology, then eventually that becomes normalized. Again, I'm old enough to remember when Facebook was brand new and uh, and uh, wasn't normal. But then, you know, so I've seen the progression through, hey, this is a new thing. I've never heard of this before and, and it's very unused and but it's becoming more popular. And then I've gotten to the point where, OK, now my, you know, mother who's in her 80s is on Facebook and has been for quite a while now. So um, it's become normalized to the point where you know, it seems like everybody has a Facebook account, which is why then we use it then for mediated communication. In many ways, it has taken the place of phone calls and, and uh, different things like that. Right? It's become almost a, a centralized part of our lives. Um, and then because of that, though, people want something new, something different. So you have the advent of, you know, as by extension, then Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and so forth, right? As, as sort of flowing out of that, that Facebook world, um, and, and continuing to, to develop and adopt these new tools. And then they become normalized and they become a, a preferred form of mediated communication, right? So, um, so, but all of this impact is impacted by us. It's not just the technology driving everything. It's okay. What's the human role in this? Or do we decide to accept this technology or not? Do we make it a normal, you know, sort of normalize it and make it a central part of our lives? Or is it just kind of this oddity that sits out there and, and a few people use it, but not, not most people. It's not mainstream. And does it become, you know, this central part of our, our communication um, uh, life? Um, so there is a human element to this though. It's not just the technology driving human development. It's this symbiosis of, humans and technology uh, interacting together and engaging together and and growing and, and evolving together right so it's important to remember again that we have this symbiotic relationship technology and human beings and the and the environment meaning again the context the culture in which we live uh, all work together and kind of you know are in this mix influencing one another at all times Right. It's like uh, if you were a kid and you had siblings or you, you went somewhere with your friends, if you were all in the back seat, you had three or four people in the back seat, right? You're all kind of nudging each other, trying to get a little more space, right? But you're impacting the others and there's only so much space. And so if one person moves to the left, that means somebody's losing some space. So you're all impacting everything that one person does. When one person gets wiggly, it affects everybody. The same thing is true with human interaction and technology and the environment culture and and systems around us when one of those things gets wiggly the others are affected and they impact one another they grow together they evolve together 
That's the idea behind media ecology and looking at the relationship between those things and the way that they impact our um, connection with and the way that we relate to one another. So I hope that you'll dig into this a little further. It's really a fascinating area that I've only been able to really scratch the surface of. So I, I truly hope that you'll spend a little more time with this on your own as you're able. If you have any questions in the meantime about media ecology or anything else related to media communication, please feel free to email me. I would love to chat with you and, and share any ideas that you might have or, and, and provide any insight that I can on this topic. Um, in the meantime, again, I hope that you will give some consideration to what your relationship is with technology, how that impacts your connection with others and the way that you communicate and relate to others. And, uh, you know, how we see this unfolding down the road and how that may change as these things grow and as we grow and, and, and change in our own, uh, what we have available to us for communication. 